Buying the right Mac can sometimes feel like an overwhelming task. There are a ton of specs to look at, many of which overlap and have varying degrees of importance, and it's not always clear what you need for a specific workflow. A software developer might have vastly different needs compared to a student, designer, or video editor, and because these machines are not upgradable, it's easy to end up overspending on features that you'll never use or on the flip side, get something that doesn't have enough power. Some of these models are also quite expensive, so today I want to try to clarify and break down the whole lineup for each type of user, all the way from basic casual use to more demanding workflows. Let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've been lucky enough to have tested most new Macs over the last few years, and I would say as someone who has done a ton of creative work, but also as a background in software development, I use my machine for a variety of use cases. At times, that has made it difficult for me to really know which computer or laptop is the right one for me, and I've noticed a lot of buying guides tend to focus on specs without really explaining what machine is right for each type of user, and more importantly, why. The truth is, Apple's lineup has gotten so powerful that the most basic machine these days will outperform the best pro-level machine from five or six years ago, which is pretty incredible, but there are still some critical decisions that can make or break your experience, so we're going to sort through all of that, starting with the basics. Let's say you're an everyday user with basic needs. That might mean that you're browsing the web, social, checking emails, streaming, and doing basic productivity. You honestly don't need much. The base M4 Mac Mini, M4 iMac, or M4 MacBook Air will be more than good enough. And frankly, if you head to Apple's refurbished site, which by the way is a great place to start regardless of which Mac you're looking at, more on that later, but on there, even the base M2 or M3 machines that only have 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage can be fine for that. And let's break down why. For starters, basic stuff doesn't require a lot of storage, so 256 gigs is likely okay here. And the thing that we want to look at is memory. At 8 gigs, between 2 and 4 that is going to get eaten up by the operating system, which will be your biggest consumer. And file operations and general usage can take up a little more, which activates a total of 4 to 6 gigabytes of memory. That leaves you with about 2 to 4 available, which is enough to have about 5 browser tabs open, the mail app, messages, and music streaming. But the nice thing about how Apple Silicon works is that you can technically go over that allotted 8 gigs of RAM as the system is really good at managing your memory. macOS optimizes the RAM by compressing any inactive items in memory, which will shrink it down a bit. And if it starts getting close to capacity, it'll also move the least used data to SSD storage via memory swapping. That's essentially using parts of your internal storage as memory, and it's not nearly as fast, but because the OS is usually storing less used items in there, as a user it's not something that you generally notice. That will allow you to run a lot more on these machines, and it's why you may have seen me talk about how I've been able to edit photos and videos on the base 8 gig machines in past videos on the channel, but that does have a limit where anything after about a 5 gigabyte swap will start to slow things down and make things unresponsive. That usually just means you have to be a lot more aware of what you have open. Video streaming can eat up just under a gig of RAM at times, video chats and meetings are about the same, and Office apps are often between 2 and 600 megabytes, so you really only want to have one or two of those things going at once, which is why for most people, the next step up at 16 gigs of RAM, which is what all the new machines start with, is going to be a lot safer. Now, you can still find 16 gigs of RAM in those M2 and M3 machines on the refurb site, and again, there's more than enough processing power in those and the new M4 to cover most people's needs. If you're just an average user, you can have a ton of browser tabs open with most of your apps open at once, but let's say you're going beyond that. Maybe you're a designer, a developer, or some kind of content creator or editor. This is going to be a good starting point, but it's also where things get 
a little more complicated. Before we get into that though, I want to talk about something that can be helpful for all types of users, which comes from today's sponsor, Surfshark. As someone who is constantly researching new products, downloading software, and creating content, especially in the summertime where I'm on the go a lot, I'm always connected to random networks, coffee shops, hotels, you name it. Without a VPN, on those networks, all that data can be visible to anyone on the same network. And sometimes the data on those networks is sold to third parties, so not ideal. Surfshark essentially creates a tunnel where your data is protected from that. And also, say if I'm trying to access region-locked content for research, maybe reviewing international apps or seeing how different services perform that are geo-locked, I can easily get around that with Surfshark. It just runs quietly in the background, making everything I do safer and more flexible. And if you want to try it out for yourself, head over to surfshark.com slash Ericsson or use code Ericsson at checkout to get an extra four months of Surfshark VPN. And they've got a 30 day money back guarantee. So there is no risk of giving it a shot. All right, back to talking about a bit more complicated Mac usage. Let's say that you're a designer. There are multiple types of designers, all with different needs. A UI designer or illustrator is gonna need far less power than someone doing animation or 3D work. So these M3 or M4 machines with 16 gigs of RAM likely have everything you need. Figma and Illustrator generally use between two and eight gigs of RAM, depending on how complex your files are, but some of the file sizes you're working with can be quite large and you're often storing them locally in the case of Illustrator. So 256 gigs of storage can be restrictive. I would bump that up to a minimum of 512. Outside that, if you're doing more resource intensive things with animation like 2D motion graphics and apps like After Effects, or maybe you plan on doing them down the road, that is where I would consider upgrading to an M3 or M4 Pro chip in a desktop or MacBook Pro. You're likely going to want the higher performing GPU and more RAM for those tasks as they are a lot more resource intensive. A 2D motion graphics project in After Effects will typically eat up between 8 and 16 gigs of RAM on its own, and it does rely heavily on the GPU. So just to make sure everything is running smooth, I would be getting an M3 or M4 Pro where I would consider bumping up the RAM from 24 to 48 gigs if you think that you're going to be working on anything complex there. Also, if you're looking at the M4 Pro and you don't know which variant to get, whether that be the 12 core or the 14 core version, I've got both here and I personally find it very hard to tell the difference between the two most of the time. So I would probably stick with the 12 core one, unless there's something that you really know that you're gonna need with that 14 core model. Super complex projects with motion and VFX can use between 16 and 32 gigs of RAM. So bumping that up to at least 48 in very advanced workflows is worth considering. And if you're at that point or you're considering introducing a lot of VFX or getting into 3D modeling or animation, it may be worth considering moving from the Pro to the Max chipset. An M3 or M4 Max chip is going to have a lot more power to effectively handle more complex 3D models. It's got around double the GPU cores, which translates to roughly double the GPU performance. And unlike the models under the Max chips that share the exact same media engine with a single encode and decode engine, the Max chips have dual encode and decode engines, effectively processing and rendering media twice as fast as the models below them. That can be noticeable for things like importing and playing back media and speeds up rendering times and is very similar to video editing in that regard, where there are a lot of similarities that we'll get into, but basically if you plan on doing a lot of complex stuff or advanced world building, max chips are the safest bet. Now, like I said, the base M3 and M4 chips are still super powerful and you can use most of these apps like After Effects or Blender on a smaller scale. They just might be a little slower. I'm essentially just trying to recommend the most ideal machine in each scenario, but if you are limited by budget or you're just getting started in these fields, the M4 Air, iMac or Mac Mini is a good place to start. 
It just might struggle through more advanced workflows. Also, because you're working on something where visuals and colors are so important, you'll likely want a color accurate display and all of Apple's displays do have great color accuracy, whether you're on a MacBook, a iMac, or a studio display. The only reason I bring this up is because if you buy a Mac Mini or a secondary display, you may end up using a third party monitor, so it's just one other thing that you'll have to consider. That'll be the same for anyone relying on color, whether it's design or content creation. And for folks that are doing basic photo and video editing, the Base M4 is a solid place to start. I know personally, I can edit photos and make these kinds of videos without any issues on the M3 or M4 MacBook Air. I used a configuration with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage to edit videos on a 4K timeline and edit photos in Lightroom and Affinity Photo just fine. Basic photo editing on raw photos that are between 24 and 33 megapixels usually take up between 2 and 4 gigs of RAM where it will go a bit higher using AI features or adjusting some settings. And with video editing, 4K footage with a couple of tracks or layers usually eats up between 8 and 12 gigs of RAM, but for the most part, everything is quite smooth. That being said, both of these things can take up an enormous amount of storage. Raw photos can take up 30 to 50 megabytes each, while you can easily use up 1 to 200 gigabytes of storage per video project. The way I alleviate this is by using an external SSD, but if you want an all-in-one solution for these workflows, I would bump that up to at least one or two terabytes. Also, if you're getting into more advanced workflows where with photo editing, you're doing a lot of batch editing or working with very large catalogs of raw photos, or you're editing videos with more tracks and effects that use higher resolutions or bit rates, your memory usage is going to climb up quite a bit. In a timeline with 5.9K footage from my Lumix S12, that goes up to just under 20 gigs of memory usage in Final Cut Pro. So again, bumping that RAM up to 24 or 32 gigs and above is a good idea, but just like when we were talking about design workflows, this is when you want to start thinking about the pro or max level chips. Those are going to deal with GPU heavy effects a bit better as you do have more GPU cores. Say if I've got a bunch of stacked color clips or something, but the thing that you need to look out for here are those media engines. Because the base and pro chips do have the exact same engines, so render times and general playback will feel largely the same. They can still be quite quick, and for most people, it's not something that I would worry about, but if you want to see a considerable difference there, you'll need to go to a Max or even an Ultra chip, where the Max chip has those dual encode and decode engines, and the Ultra has quad encode and decode engines. Faster encoding and decoding times can sometimes save you hours if you're pushing out a lot of proxied clips or sharing rendered video back and forth. That is one of the main reasons I got the Mac Studio with the M3 Ultra, as it shaves off hours for me each week, but I would say that is somewhat of a niche use case. I think a good question to ask yourself if you're a content creator, a photographer, or video editor is how complex your workflow is. If you are keeping it fairly simple, a base M3 or M4 machine is probably just fine, but if you find yourself working with larger files or you're adding some complexity, or you think that you might down the road, looking at a Pro or Max machine is a better option, provided it's within your budget. Another thing that I've done a lot of on these machines is coding, and if you are into software development, just like everything else here, the base M3 or M4 with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage is a great place to start. I found most front-end projects on that config work great, whether that's just a simple React or Next.js project, a local WordPress setup, or something that is a little more complex that's using Docker. In all of those cases, normally I'm adding well below 8 gigs of RAM in usage, so no worries there. And because the projects are all relatively small, build times are quick, where there's no real hangups anywhere. Now, that could change, say, if you're someone who's part of a team and you have a larger scale app that you have to pull down and compile often. I know that sometimes larger apps, even if you're only working on smaller parts of them, can 
take a long time to compile. And you do see a pretty big improvement in compile times, going from a base M3 or M4 to a Pro chip. Again, it's not something that you're gonna notice on a simple project that builds in seconds, but if a project takes a half hour to build on an M4, it might be five or 10 minutes faster on the M4 Pro. Likewise, if you have advanced build pipelines or requirements like running virtual machines, 16 gigs of RAM likely won't be enough, and I would shoot for 32 2 gigs or so, especially with VMs, and that kind of falls in line with mobile development as well. Now, I worked as both a front-end and mobile developer for years, and I did get by on an M-series Mac with 16 gigs of RAM, but I was doing a lot of boutique or smaller apps, and even then, specifically on mobile, I did feel some friction from time to time iOS simulators and Android emulators can eat up a lot of RAM, especially emulators, which are essentially just VMs. So having those running plus whatever other stuff you've got going on, it might be local backend or design files, whatever the case may be. 16 gigs can definitely feel stretched thin at times, so bumping that up to 24 and above is a good idea. I also find that build times can come into play a little bit more on mobile, so if you can swing an M3 or M4 Pro machine into your budget, it can speed up your workflow, although it isn't entirely necessary unless you're dealing with something on a much larger scale, but the storage is something that I would definitely address here. Dev tools like Xcode can use up a ton of storage between all the simulators that you've got to download, and if you work on a ton of different apps like I used to, the derived data folder can sometimes get huge, so that plus everything else that you've got on your machine can hit that 512 gig limit, and a better option is likely to start at one one terabyte, and backend development I would say is somewhat similar. Backend can involve heavier runtime environments, databases, servers, and infrastructure tooling. Those services by themselves don't necessarily take up more resources than what we've gone over so far, but you're often using more of them concurrently where it's easy to rack up 6 to 10 gigs of RAM before you even open an IDE or code editor. On top of that, you might be working with VMs, and I think you're much more reliant on fast build time, so this is where a Pro or a Max chip with a higher level of RAM potentially makes more sense. And if you want to go even further than that, let's say that you're working with AI or machine learning at minimum, you probably want a fairly specced out M4 Max or even an M3 Ultra with a bare minimum of 64 gigs of RAM. The reason why this is the case is because the models required in those workflows take an enormous amount of processing power. Even the smallest 7B models often take a minimum of 14 gigs of memory, and popular 7db models can take upwards of 140 gigs of memory. And because the Max and Ultra chips have a high memory bandwidth, which, by the way, this is one of the only use cases where memory bandwidth does make a considerable difference, but that makes these ideal for that kind of work. Now, I haven't really talked a whole lot about students here because I wanted to give an overarching look at what each type of user looks like, as that will probably reflect what you might be doing as a student. As a student, presumably you won't be getting into anything too crazy as you're still learning, where you won't be doing anything super advanced, so something in the middle of the pack here will be fine. And if you are restricted on budget, even for some of those larger workflows, you can still get a surprising amount done on the base M3 or M4 machines. I would also take advantage of that refurbished site if you are on a budget or a student because everything from there is like brand new and comes with the same warranty as new products and you're going to be able to find some older models on there at more of a discount but if you are buying a current model, I would definitely utilize the education store if you can, because you will save yourself some money there as well. Also, I know that I mostly just went over specifics in terms of performance, but you should also consider things like how many ports you need, if you prefer a desktop machine, or you need something more mobile like a laptop, and what accessories you plan to use. But we just don't have time to go over all of that here today. I will, however, drop some links in the description below if you want to learn more about accessories for your Mac and using external storage. And please, if I did not talk about a certain type of user and that user is you, please drop a comment down below and let everyone know what machine or config works best for you and what you're using it for. But 
That is all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech related content or help me design a macOS focus mode that plays elevator music when your productivity drops below 40%, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.